Hi, so we are planning to have a stir meeting here for the benefit of remote participants as soon as we can um, find a chair. Does anyone have Russ Housley's phone number? Thanks.
It's not like we're going to take this entire hour anyway, right? It's not like we have enough material for that, so. Just to get some administrative stuff out of the way while we are waiting for the chairs, I'm going to start the blue sheets and I'm going to give you a few moments to think about who really wants to be a minute taker for this meeting and who wants to sit in the Jabber room and scribe. I'll be back in the microphone to take answers. It seems to have crashed the meat echo machine. Right, that doesn't seem to be good. Uh, if anyone on meat echo is monitoring this, it would be good to have this taken care of. Okay, I'm back here now. Who wants to take minutes? Thank you very much, John. And Jabber Scribes, just for taking information to and from the Jabber Room. Ted, I saw you were in the Jabber Room. Can I, can I rope you into this? OK. Yes, you can, you can use your chip. Krister, can I, can I compel you to just sit in the Jabber Room? Describing for us. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, this floor is very tricky if you're like used to using the south elevators. So the screen there in the middle is showing exactly what I'm seeing up here, which is a white screen that says loading dot, dot, dot in very small characters in the upper left corner. So pressing the button doesn't do anything at the moment. Thank you. Well, as, as John points out, luckily we're not planning on filling the entire slot. If you want to just jump into your presentation and then have Russ do the... Oh, hey, something happened. 
was, uh, I don't know if anybody actually uploaded anything into the fancy data tracker yet. Okay. Good. Welcome to STIR. <laughs> you, you should be familiar with the note well by now. If you're not, please pay attention. This has implications about how you're supposed to behave, how you're supposed to uh, disclose IPR, a variety of other important things, and down near the bottom are the specific documents to talk about exactly how this works. Um, so today, I've already got a minute taker diversified blue sheets. We are going to be talking about, let's see, out of band, shaken, uh, the divert draft, and RCD. Is it, go ahead. Oh, I think uh, Chris will actually be doing RCD instead of me. Okay. So that's bash number one. Any other bashes? Anything else people would love to discuss? Martin Dolly, I'm sure you have a five minute lightning talk you want to give. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if we actually have any of the other materials uploaded here, which let's see if we can figure out how to do that real fast. I think and you need to be a in. Yeah, I'm a chair. Are you sharing anything right now? Um, yes. I'm sorry, which is yes? Oh, they are uploaded, I propose, suppose. Go ahead and see if we reload and see if they're up there now. Slides, slides it just I says share are, slides. Are share slides, Robert. Am I looking at the wrong thing? Um. Ah, here we go. Okay. Hello, hello. Can anybody hear me? We can uh, hear you now. I see. I see that. Geez, it. Thanks. Yes, you were looking at the wrong thing. Apparently, this, <laughs> the page, the agenda page, is is cached for a couple of hours. You need to go to the materials page for Stir. The link is in the Jabber room. What's up here? So the materials page for STIR is actually, oh, I see. Quit using those Do you want to try to that. These are all, all the slides are in this STIR GZIP or, wait, oh, yeah, I see. There we go. Okay. We got it. Wizardry. That's a draft. That's not good. Why is that? So oh. seriously, I'm trying to tell you how to get to where you want to go quickly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, okay, I'm fighting. Let me see. So where? What, what am I doing wrong, Robert? So grab your browser window. Go to your URL bar. Yeah. Type data tracker ietf.org slash yeah. group slash stir slash meetings. Okay. Hit enter. There's a okay. material. Scroll back up. Right hand. Hit yep. that. That's Got what it. you should have been seeing on the main agenda page. Got it. Correct you are. Okay. So this looks like what we want. I assume we can get started. Okay, so um, this document uh, is pretty close to being done. I'm getting, I got a few uh, comments back that it probably would be good to um, go through, although I have uh, responded on the list. So um, if you've been watching the list, um, you see similar comments, but I'll just go through them quickly. Next page. Uh, there was a request for some privacy considerations for a privacy consideration section. 
Um, I provided text to talk specifically about ORIG ID um, to make sure there wasn't any confusion about um, ORIG ID as a um, uh, uh, indicator that might uh, expose something. Um, it's important to recognize ORIG ID is not um, the does not have anything to do with the originator of a call. It's actually something that we put into Shaken as an as a unique opaque unique identifier, so that the service provider would have some way of tracing back to where the call was originated, not the originator themselves. Um, I guess I recognize that that is somewhat confusing potentially, but um, suffice it to say the um, intention really is there that this identifier, at least as it's defined and shaken, is um, supposed to be opaque. Um, there's uh, um, and represent the origination of the call and not the, so, so there's no uh, personal identification being leaked uh, with this So um, I think it was at my suggestion that you pointed into 3261 and 3323 at the front of this. Um, I haven't gone to read what's in the uh, um, base passport spec. I think, if memory serves right, you should just you should just be able to point to that instead, and it will talk about all these other things. So okay point to the base passport spec and you did verify that it no, points to those I'm, I'm just going off memory I don't John, John was nodding his head yeah I think that's right. I, I mean that, so actually. to be honest I mean 30 3323 you know the privacy properties that it provides probably aren't that well aligned with this particular issue anyway I think what's what's more material to it would be um, again that the fact that there are this, this does not contain personally identifying information in any real way, right? This is something that is used um, as a very opaque identifier for network resources rather than people. And, you know, in the second place that um, there are known countermeasures, right? If you're concerned about people tracking these things, you can just generate a new one that you, because this is basically internal to service provider networks, right? So like if you, if there's one trunk that you're identifying with an ridge ID, you could, if you felt like it, like generate a different ORIG ID that pointed to that same trunk every time you placed a call. Um, so I, mean, I think the, the aggregate of those two things probably closes any privacy gap I'd be worried about. It's, it's worth, I'm sure, pointing in general to the security properties of 8225 to the passport page spec and that. But yeah, I think, I think those two things really probably satisfy me anyway on it. Yeah, John had provided that comment um, before this meeting. Um, I'm happy to incorporate text like that as a suggestion to potentially get around any privacy concerns. Yes, next slide. Okay, next slide. Whoop. Ah, is this the next one? Yes, this is the next one. Okay. Yeah, this one should hopefully be pretty straightforward. Uh, there was a request to in include um, some terminology definitions. Uh, the first one is verified association. Um, it, it's something that's used in, is actually taken from the shaken specs, but I, it's, it's fine to define it here. Um, and essentially it means, you know, some way that you can authenticate the user to make sure that they're um, initiating the call. Um, and then, or actually the user's device to be more specific. Um, and then also there was a request to include a reference uh, to Passport and how it's defined in 8225. Any questions with this? Sounds good. Next page. Um, and then uh, there was also a comment I got um, specifically um, to um, describe in the abstract um, 
a little more contextually for what's being described in the document versus talking about like how it's coming from Shaken and IPNI and all that other stuff. And um, I actually agree with that. So I wrote uh, some new text, um, you know, talking of giving a brief description of um, both the attest and orig ID, um, the purpose of those and what's described in the document. Any questions on that? Okay, good. So all the other comments were editorial. I, I have uh, corrected all those in my local copy. Um, I think based on at least the privacy section, I'll put a new version of that on the list. And then um, if I don't get any comments back, I'll release a N05, if that makes sense. Okay. That's it okay. for me. Thank you. So I think. Wait, Adam? Yeah, Adam Roach is area director. So my plan then is to put this into IETF last call as soon as the 05 comes out, unless anyone has an objection. So, all right, I'm seeing some light nodding. I'll go with that. Thanks. Thank you. I think it's me. Oh, will be next. Yeah, this converted so well from Keynote. Um, okay, I'll get up. Yep. Hi, so I have like virtually nothing to say about Divert, um, but what, I'll say a couple things anyway. I put up a couple slides that just give us an excuse to talk about it. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for those of you that do not recall this document at all, it has been in working group last call here for a bit, and we did have at least some uh, eyeballs on it. This is the, a document that is fixing a known kind of gap in storage capabilities in cases where there is call forwarding, basically, uh, where the administrative domain that, that was the original target for a call wants to be able to tell you, nah, go somewhere else instead. And so we created this new div attribute. It's a new kind of passport, really. It has an interesting property that the entity that signs these passports is not signing based on its authority over the orig field in passport, the originator of the call, but instead over the dest. Um, because it's saying, yes, I was the destination for this call, and I'm telling you, instead, go talk to this guy. And this is useful to, pro to basically help verification services to understand why it is that, that a call reached them, right? Uh, to prevent a certain class of cut and paste attack where an attacker could just grab an arbitrary passport. You know, if, if Chris is trying to call me and somebody grabs that passport and instead uh, sends a call to Martin claiming that they're from Chris, uh, Martin can look at this and be like, this, this was to John, right? But of course, if sending Chris sends me an invite and I then uh, generate this div passport, it'll show, yeah, I'm John and I'm saying this call is actually supposed to go to Martin. So when Martin gets it, he'll go, oh, I see how that worked as a verification service. Everything works out fine. And you need this for a couple of use cases that actually matter. Um, there's ways that local number portability is implemented in some areas that have this property. Free phone systems that convert to geographic numbers have this property. So it's actually kind of useful. A lot of people seem to want it. Next slide. Um, so based on uh, the enlightened guidance of Eric Berger at the previous ITF meeting, we have made nesting in this a must. That is to say that whenever you see a div passport, it's going to have within it the original passport encoded with this new opt um, element that we have defined for passport. Uh, we also made opt completely independent of div. So actually future extensions want to make use of having some original passport embedded inside a passport for some reason. Uh, they'll be able to just reference the specification to pick that up. There are a couple of other use cases that people have batted around where that might actually be useful. Um, the one, of course, consequence of this, it kind of, it's a trade-off, right? Um, previously, we we're talking about doing this all with multiple identity headers, and then you'd have to try to figure out, okay, which one of these divs goes with which of these original passports. Um, so now we no longer have any of the confusions that might arise from that, but what we have instead are really long passports. And so we want to make sure as this goes out into the wild that uh, people appreciate long headers could be generated by this. I actually tried to mock up reasonably accurate examples of what those sizes were in this version of the draft, which I hadn't really previously done. And so you can kind of get a sense of what the hit of this uh, will really practically look like. So that's what's new. This was what we agreed on last time. That's, that's really the only major change that we made. There was a lot of minor textual places we previously talked about non-nested approaches that had to be extirpated. Next slide. 
So one issue that's come up relatively recently, thanks to the tireless work of the folks over at Addis trying to figure out all the conceivable use cases in which Div might be used, and I've had many great conversations with Chris and Kate Pancock and others about this, um, is I guess a question that Dave and Chris raised to me about kind of pre-Div solutions, where you know, do we want to be able to have um, a signature available over request URIs as well as over the original two header fields in STIR? And um, my initial reaction to that was pretty much, well, I kind of think of a request URI um, as a more ephemeral, I guess, um, piece of contact information that gets associated with calls and frequently modified and things like that. But I think that, you know, the way that Chris phrased this that, that maybe made me see most why we might want to say something about it was, what do you do if you're an authentication service and you get a call that you're supposed to be signing that's been sent to you by some SIP UA, and the two in the request URI are already different. Um, and you know that you can't tell whether that difference reflects a semantic change, that is that this is a different administrative domain, for example, than what the original two header field signified. Like kind of how do you handle it and what, what do you make of that situation? And this comes back to a, the kind of the core principles behind STIR. You know, we, we want to sign over the two header field in order to make it possible for verification services to have an idea of who the original caller was trying to reach, right? And whether or not they are, you know, that person or that administrative entity. And so, you know, I, I think that, that that principle is a good one. And if, if we wanted to alter it, we'd have to go back into 4424, really, to alter it in 4425. Um, this isn't something that's like specific to the div spec, and there's nothing we do in div that would kind of change that. Um, and it, there is kind of a gap that opens in this too. If for example, you are only signing over the request URI um, and not over the two, which is one one proposal that I heard. Um, you know, that, then I think you know I can imagine a class of attacks where you want to say convince United Airlines that the original call number was you know one eight hundred United one, and that you know but you're only signing over the request URI and that's what's in the desk. And um, you, you could kind of just represent, oh well, this had gotten securely redirected previously to you. And that there, there could be vulnerabilities that would open up from that. Um, so my initial intuition on this anyway was that I kind of like things the way they are. Um, I guess I kind of, um, I think Div was created specifically to take care of these use cases where there was a change in the administrative domain that is semantically meaningful. And so um, I, I guess my thinking is I, I'm pretty comfortable with the way the mechanism stands now. But since this came up, and you know, I think people are concerned about what to do in that, that case, it might be worth like adding some language to the spec, to the div spec. It just kind of explains more why it works the way it does and why we, we don't want to change it to reflect this. But if, if anybody here wants to talk more about this use case or other use cases where maybe signing the two doesn't seem like the right thing to do, but instead signing the request UI or both. I mean, remember, DEST is an array, right? So we, we could sign both the two and the request URI in an authentication service. I'm not sure there's much value though in signing a request URI in, in the first place. But Chris, if you want to speak to it. Yeah, yeah, I think um, you know, it was sort of the free phone use case where the the retargeting actually happens in the originating network typically or or at least in an intermediary network um, that was the most discussed part of this, but I think you know, after we discuss this, a light bulb went off on my head that that it really is a different use case than the typical like call forwarding case where, you know, it's going from network to network versus, um, you know, the case where, you know, you're calling 1-800-UNITED and um, it's just a geographic telephone number that's being um, retargeted to and therefore the end uh, consumer of that call knows that it's representing 1-800-UNITED um, versus it's actually like a totally different telephone number yeah. that does need to be verified. So I think we just need to, um, well, in, in this draft, it'd be nice to talk about the differentiation between those two cases. And then I think on the uh, shaken side, we do need to accommodate those cases um, just to make those clear. 
Yeah, I mean, cases where the redirection or the retargeting has already occurred on the originating side, you know, this this is exactly what diversion right was created for back in the day, and we, we don't we don't love diversion here in the ITF so much, but history info right is the mature version of that, and we we have created these plugins that make div work with those things specifically for precisely this use case. So I mean, I, I I hope that it works. I mean, I can imagine an authentication service right that is privy to a dip that has been made to SMS 800 locally, even creating the whole like div, right? <laughs> I mean, like provided it can sign for it, like that's not in any way outside realm possibility. So um, yeah, I mean, my pre preference would be, of course, that whoever is, you know, fielding those SMS 800 queries actually in turn generates the full div for the call and sends it back. Um, but I could imagine other architectures where that is much more internal to a network. So, yeah, I'm happy to add some text to, to talk a bit more about this, but this this is, I think at this point, you know, I'm confident the core, this would be descriptive text, the core mechanism I think is is correct for this, or I, I don't see what we change about the mechanism to reflect it. Mm -hmm. yep. Which is good, because that would mean that, you know, we, we, we should last call this and, and be done, right? Go ahead, Robert. So I want to um, weigh in as a plus one on not trying to change the mechanism to um, address protecting the request URI, especially if you take the case that you've um, that, that that you're considering in Addis and simplifying it to a pure SIP network. If somebody steps in and hands you a SIP request that has a request URI that is wholly unrelated to the two. Um, you know, what, what does that mean for, for your signature? So. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, um, you know, we, we don't lay a lot of con, you know, re, constraints on what policy decisions authentication services and verification services make for good reason. Um, I can imagine authentication services that would be upset about that, but I could also imagine ones that would say, I know why this is happening, and I'm still confident signing the two, right? And so um, that, 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 you know, as long as you have the proper credential to sign for the two-header field, I can kind of see you still doing it in that case, but. Chris Wine again. Um, yeah, I think we were trying to make all these things sort of generic, and this does add a little bit of logic there that yeah, it makes it a little more complex, unfortunately. But uh, um, you know, I guess that's SIP in general. Uh, well, I mean, again, the, how these policy decisions get made, and we, we, you know, I wonder if someday, because there's so much energy in this working group to take on new work, I can tell. But you know, we could do a whole document that's like, here are some not insane policies for why authentication services and verification services should sign and you know validate things, respectively and what we imagine they're going to present to the application or ultimately they might get rendered to a user on the verification side as a result of receiving a valid passport. Um, and you know, that maybe there is more exact guidance than we give in 8224, because there's a bit of guidance in there, right? But it's, it's very policy free. It's very much like, well, if the date is within like this threshold, this is what you should do and things like that. Um, but we very intentionally like, we're not going to say anything about why you sign or accept these things. Um, you know, if there was an appetite to explore that more, I think we would be getting into that territory very quickly if we started trying to answer the question, well, should an authentication service really sign a two-header field if, you know, the request that comes to it has a, a request URI that is radically different? Um, I, I think I can imagine very good reasons for signing that, and I can also imagine policies where it'd be like, we shouldn't do that. Maybe even domain specific ones, right? That's the point. Yeah, I guess it's the exceptions that you can handle the request URI change, but any of the standard call forwarding scenarios, you should absolutely have a div. And that, I mean, that's my preference. Yeah, that my preference is that you are creating a div if you have, you know, uh, if this call has been forwarded, if there's a request URI that is radically different from um, from the original two header field. That would be my preference because it. 
just because it'll make it easier for a verification service to make sense of it when it actually ultimately receives the request. That's the I whole idea behind doing this, is so you can have some assurance that this is not a cut and paste attack against you. See, so look, we had some discussion. We had substantive discussion about div. I promised we'd have a little bit. Um, yeah, I think I think we're pretty close on this. I would say I'm comfortable last calling it as is. Um, you know, I'd always be happy to see more eyes on it. Eric actually caught a lot of just fumbled grammar and malformed ideas. So if other people feel like reading it during working group last call, that would be great. Can anyone offer a reason why it's not ready for working group last call? Okay, we'll start it this week. Thank you, gentlemen. Adam, you have something to share. It's actually on the previous draft. So uh, Adam Roach, as area director again, I realized when I sat down that I had mixed some things up in my head and the shaken draft has been through IETF last call yes. already. We're not doing that again. No. What I meant to say is as soon as the 05 comes out, we'll be putting it on an uh, IESG agenda. agenda. So yeah, we're okay. closer to the finish line. That's what I interpreted your words to mean. So I was Thank you. transferring the state. I, I got some confused email on the topic. So I was like, yeah, I, I, I botched that. Thanks. <laughs> all right, next slide. <laughs> what is right. that? Well, this is the thing. Like, it got all, like, I, so I, I had it in PowerPoint and I converted it to Keynote and then I, like, had to mail it from my, anyway. I won't do that again. Um, I have virtually nothing to say about this document. Next slide. It's called Out of Band. It's this document that's about the Out of Band stuff, about the notion that maybe some protocol other than SIP might have use for passports. Uh, this is an idea that I think we can't afford to ignore, given the fact that to date, not all telephone calls use end-to-end -end SIP. Next slide. Um, so it's in working class. Is it out of working class call? It's, it's pretty close, right? Yeah, I thought this did. I think it, it may be complete around now, working group last call. Boy, if there really was, uh, you know, some heated discussion about this in the list. Um, you know, I was receiving a lot of instant messages and texts, and um, there's some really interesting blog posts. No, nobody had anything to say about this document, which is not surprising. I know that this is this is a pet cause of um, me, but. Um, our idea, of course, here was just to declare a victory without really specifying much more than a sketch of a mechanism and to say, put a pin in it. You know, we've kind of defined what the problem looks like, what the solution space looks like. And if a fire gets lit under this by someone who, say, wakes up tomorrow and realizes not all telephone calls use SIP, uh, maybe we'll go spin something back up and like use, use this for something. To, to be clear, where we are, working group last call has been initiated a while ago, but we have not had the consensus call yet. Okay. So we should probably have a consensus call that everyone here consents to the fact that nobody cares and we're gonna bring this forward. <laughs> okay, that it's, that it's worth documenting. I think we, we got to that point on this, and um, but that it was not worth really driving it into a, a fuller mechanism at this point. What I think the agreement coming out of Montreal was, uh, was that we were going to publish this framework, um, but we weren't going to publish details of protocol instances that implement the framework. Right. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't That's know. It's your last slide, right? Yeah, well, yeah. If anybody wants to read this or okay. talk to me about it or, or if, suddenly say, hey, we really need this, I'll, I'll be waiting. I'll be carrying a torch for this. I will have a torch song for out of band. I think we're about to make the consensus call on that. If so, if there are any last minute issues, please post them immediately. And I think that's it. I think Chris is going to talk about our CD. Call data, right? Oh, if you hit that. <clears throat> 
Okay, next page. Um, so I guess uh, we sort of wanted to, we had this rich call data thing and calling name and some uh, things I'm gonna talk about uh, are important and we didn't wanna ignore it and wanted to get it, uh, it updated um, and hopefully out fairly quickly because I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, next page. Um, so in this update specifically, um, we included a mechanism for, um, well, we already had the RCD claim defined, um, which includes uh, the name field, which is basically including the name that uh, is included uh, for caller ID. Um, um, but we thought um, the issue, like, you know, thinking about including rich call data extension with a shaken extension. Um, and I think in general, calling name or rich call data is going to be something that's combined with other potential extensions easily. We thought it'd be nice to have a mechanism that would allow you to simply add um, this without having to define a sort of like, I have an example here of a shaken plus RCD passport extension. Um, so I think because this is probably going to be pretty commonly used, um, we thought, why don't we add the ability, if you support this um, specification, that uh, you just add an RCD claim to your existing extension um, passport and all of the rules that are defined in this document for interpreting that claim could be followed. Um, it's just at the verification service, if it understands how to use uh, the RCD claim, it can interpret it um, correctly. Um, but if it doesn't understand RCD, then you can just simply ignore it, just like any other JWT um, in general. So hopefully that makes sense. Any questions around that? Any comments? Hey, it's John. The only thing I'd add to that is that um, for some of the third party cases we discussed, there is still a use in defining APPT type for RCD because it'll just operate with different passport rules. Right. We didn't remove that. Yeah. 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 yeah this is just an additional mechanism that we put into the document. Yep. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Uh, I just included an example because I had used this for another presentation. Um, so if anybody has any questions there, it's pretty straightforward. I just added the RCD. This, is, this happens to be a shaken example. Okay, next page. So I guess I wanted to also add um, something that uh, has been sort of discussed in different forums, but, uh, and we, we haven't been, uh, uh, proactive in getting this done, but it, I'd like to try to get this done. Um, uh, there's been a lot of chatting about using JCARD as a, a way of transporting actual rich call data, so more than just the name. Um, so I came up with this term plain old calling name versus rich call data. Um, plain old calling name being, you know, the mechanism that we all know and love currently, where in the from or the paid you include the name. Um, and that's well used in a lot of scenarios. So we don't want to change the mechanism and that's all described in the current draft. Um, but adding this uh, new mechanism, perhaps defining uh, it as a standard uh, mechanism as well. So, uh, but the only difference here is that other, uh, rather than the typical including verifying the claim and then doing a string compare against what's in the existing SIP headers. Um, you actually use the passport as the transport of the information. So, um, you know, just in particular for size reasons, to be, to be honest, um, you would include the J card in the, as a, as part of the, the RCD claim, 
um, and then you know encode it and sign it, and then that would actually be the transport me uh, mechanism rather than repeating it in the SIP header. And as a result, I sort of have a note here that um, while co compact and full form would be supported for the name, um, you know, because we're transporting the information, only full form would be supported um, for that. Do you have a comment, Sean? Okay. <laughs> Any comments, questions there? Hey, it's John. So, um, yeah, I think this, this, so I think we definitely need it. Um, and there are a couple of different ways to approach this. And probably we need to do a little bit of an exercise of figuring out how we want to approach that. Um, especially, and we just, we've discussed this before, I know, um, whether we want to include something like a J card by reference or by value. That is, if we yeah. want to have like a URL in there. The interesting thing about the URL is, of course, there are mechanisms in SIP to convey a URL is supposed to give information about the call in general that could you know, be repurposed for that. And you could actually sign that compact form style rather than actually inc including it in um, mm -hmm. the passport necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like a couple of trade-offs like that of different ways you might approach it that are probably interesting and that we should kick the tires on a bit. Totally agreed we would want to put like the whole J card like into a SIP request and then, you know, uh, to just do the signature over that in in um, in STIR, in Passport. But um, I could see if you're using a URL-based approach to including the J card, that that could in fact be in a separate SIP header and then that could be signed in compact form. Um, and you know, I think another virtue of doing this by reference rather than by value is it does allow more flexibility if there are formats other than J card, say that people are interested in for this. Um, and I, I haven't conducted that particular beauty contest myself of what I think is the best thing to express the qualities of a caller. Um, but, you know, that, that might give us basically just some modularity to be able to plug in different things. So this is Russ. Um, we have experience where a certificate contains a URL and uh, people <coughs> of realizing that's a longer lived thing than a passport. But um, when that is done, often you will see a URL followed by a hash. So that way, if you snap the, if you choose to chase the value from the URL, you compare it, what you got to the hash, and that way you know the signer and the validator are both using the same dereferenced value. Yeah. I mean, even in flight, while a SIP call is in flight, you could imagine things about the J-card changing, right? right? And that that could be surprising to the entity that generated the passport. Uh, Ted, just a follow-up question to the point that Russ just made. Uh, I'm a little confused uh, of, of what security property you think would be important in, in that when we're talking about something like a URI to a logo. Clearly, there are uh, long-lived logos that you, you might be using as identifiers uh, to say you're, you're talking to the service that you want to do. Um, but there are also, in most of these cases, some form of uh, content negotiation possible, um, either based on where you dereference it or uh, the, their presumptions about what your user agent is capable of displaying. And of course, that means that all those hashes, which might have been to some uh, canonical version either have to be each included or uh, you get a lot of failure modes. So I, I, I appreciate that in certificates having these, there, there's potentially a value, but the rich call data, I'm not sure that the value is exactly the same. Um, and so I would, I would be hesitant to, to do that unless you are quite sure that for the elements which you want to do a URL and a hash, uh, that the the nature of the object being dereferenced uh, was sufficiently static that these hashes were going to um, last as long as the the passport itself did. So um, John started his uh, comment by saying there are other places in SIP where we do this, and so I was responding to that, thinking that if we're going to build a, a mechanism that's more general, let's be wor be uh, cognizant that we want to make that some of them will have this the situation where the signer 
and the validator need to be sure they got the same object. Uh, I agree, and I think that the, the question you really then come to is, uh, where's that line between Correct. the ones you wanted and the ones where you definitely do not? Um, exactly. Uh, and I guess the question is, would that go into this document if you want to include this mechanism, or would it go into a more general one that addresses the use of URLs and SIP? Well, right now the document has passed the whole value. There's no issue. It's only yep. if we choose to support some things that are passed by reference, and then if it's only the, the uh, RCD, I don't think there's an issue. If we go beyond that, we need to make sure that that template isn't applied inappropriately to other things. Uh, that that certainly makes sense, uh, Ted Hardy again. Uh, that certainly makes sense to me, and I, I uh, appreciate the the caution there. I'd also suggest you probably want to limit the kinds of uh, uh, URL schemes which are permitted here in the same way that SIP itself does, because uh, a mismatch there seems uh, particularly problematic. <laughs> Uh, one note to consider also is JCard itself can have URLs inside of it. So, <laughs> uh, Ted Hardy again, but that's actually quite different, right? Because you're going to you're going to sign the JCard as an assemblage. You're yeah. not going to be trying to guarantee anything about the uh, the particular objects which are dereferenced. You're merely saying that this is what was presented as the JCard, right. um, and the, the 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 results of that and the results of trying to sign uh, the 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 dereferenced value, if you're incorporating it by reference, actually are pretty different in, in a lot of these situations. It's John again. I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, really, it's just me trying to get compact form back right for this is why, why I'm here. <laughs> because I, I am worried about the size that these things are like growing to, right? And if it's like a shaken passport, right, that we're then adding our CD to, and, you know, it's got a, and there's a div, <laughs> you know, like I just, I, anything we can do to like cut the passports down, I think, um, I, I'd like to at least preserve a way to do that. And so th this yeah. could be something where we allow both by reference and by value, right? That, that I think would be fine with me. And yeah, by reference may have some edges on it. We want like e tags or, or hashes or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's just some kind of a versioning system for the content that's on the other side of it. But, um, but yeah, I, in general, I, I'd like to try to find a way to get compact to work with this if we can. Yeah, and I have no opposition to, and in fact, I like including that. And I think it, it's too early to know what the industry will do um, or prefer to do, but I certainly could see a future where all J cards are dereferenced through a URL for sure. Um, <clears throat> I think we actually talked through some of this stuff. Uh, I, I just mentioned here proposing JCD as a, a name. Um, and I did make a reference to the security or verification of logos um, by URIs, which we just discussed. So I think other than that, I'm, I'm done. Okay, any last questions for Chris? Okay, that was our last agenda item. And we wrapped up with uh, seven minutes to spare. So, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.